come to worship at St. John's United Church of Christ. I'm Pastor Alyssa Boyer. I'm filling in for Pastor Caroline while she's away. And it is truly an honor to be with you this morning. We welcome one another with the same words each and every week. Please join with me now. No matter who you are, or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Let us join our hearts and spirits in worship. In this season of Epiphany, on this day that we celebrate the baptism of the Prince of Peace, let us pass the peace of Christ in person or in spirit. The peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. Let us quiet our minds and prepare our hearts for the worship of God. Responsive opening words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Spirit of God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, 
Let there be light, and God saw that it was good. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus was baptized by John. The heavens opened, and the Spirit descended like a dove. Then God said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now let us join together in singing hymn number 19, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. sins, giving thanks for the grace of Jesus Christ, the one who has come to save us. Let us join in the unison prayer of confession. God of all glory, you look from heaven and see us as we are, not worthy to kneel at your feet, not ready to welcome your way. Forgive us, gracious God. In Christ, stoop down to save us. Loosen the ties that bind us to sin and set us free to love and serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Hear the good news of the Gospel. As a voice from heaven said to Jesus, so God says to each of us, You are my beloved child, and with you I am well pleased. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
Please listen for the word of God found in the first chapter of Genesis, verses 1 through 5, Psalm 29, and the 19th chapter of Acts, verses 1 through 7. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from darkness, from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory, the God of glory thunders, the Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all say, Glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. He said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then he said, Into into what, then, were you baptized? They answered, Into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about twelve of them. May God add her blessing to the reading of her holy word. Good morning, children of God. I have something here today to show you that you that are younger and still in Sunday school will probably recognize. Does this look familiar? Well, yes, it's a cross, but think, maybe if I show you this also, ah, yeah, see, now I, now I see the light bulb going off, and maybe even if I do a little scratch there, sure, it's a cross, but in order to really get the full picture of what this is, you need to do some scratching, and when you scratch, something is revealed underneath, right? Well, I thought of one of these immediately when I read the scripture for today. Today is the second, sorry, the first Sunday in Epiphany. And it's the story of Jesus' baptism. It's recorded in Mark, first chapter. And many people, when they read this, they say, why did Jesus need to be baptized? We know John, who did the baptizing, even asked the same question. We know Jesus was free from sin. Why did he need to be baptized? Well, we're going to talk about that. If you think about baptism, of course, we are baptized with water, the meaning that it washes away our sin and also cleanses us for a life without sin, knowing that we are forgiven if we do sin. This is why John said, I baptize you with water but one who is greater than me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. If you think about the scripture, 
what happened when Jesus came up out of the water? Well, the heavens opened and a dove descended upon him. The dove was the Holy Spirit. Just as John said, the Holy Spirit will baptize you, one who has the Holy Spirit. And also the words that were heard by the people, the words from heaven, from God. This is my son with whom I am pleased. Just like the revealing when we scratch, Jesus' baptism revealed to all those around who he was. Now, at his birth, it was realized by many that the Messiah had come. But the revealing showed that he was more than just a man, more than just the Messiah. He was the Son of God. Think about that. It revealed that he was the Son of God. He was given the Holy Spirit. Here's where we get our triune God. It showed the world, or those that were there, that he was one with God. He was more than just a man, more than just a Messiah. He was God's Son sent to us. So what does this, all this mean for us? Well, we've had a very unusual year, to say the least. And if you think about all the things you've missed, and you think about all the things you would have liked to have done, it can be pretty disheartening. But also, I think through all of this pandemic that we've had, I think many have had things revealed to themselves. What has been revealed? in you. Maybe valuing family. Maybe an introspection. Maybe you've had time to think about who you are and what you want and what you want to be. Time with friends. I think maybe that'll be appreciated more. How about face-to-face -face interaction with teachers? Will you value that more? after all of this, and then the support of your church family. You've had it, but not in that face-to-face, one-on-one, direct contact. This last year has probably been a revealing for many of us. Just like Jesus' baptism revealed to the world. His baptism was the beginning of his ministry. This revealing that maybe you've had could be the beginning for you of a new and a more wonderful you. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you for sending Jesus and filling him with the Holy Spirit and for filling us with what we need, for revealing in us untapped potential and helping us to appreciate as we move forward what you have given us. In your son's name we pray, amen.
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please let us listen for the word of God as it is found in the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Here ends the reading from Holy Scripture. May God bless our hearing and living of these words. Amen. Today is the day we commemorate the baptism of our Lord. We read the story from the Gospel according to Mark. In the book of Mark, there is no nativity. There's no stable, no manger, no wise men. Mark starts here, with this moment. Mark starts with baptism. I wanted to speak with you today about baptism, about belovedness and identity and belonging in the body of Christ. But first, there is something important that I need to share with you, my siblings in Christ. Because while I was seeking during this past week to discern God's will for the message that will be shared today, I was also following the news, as I'm sure you were, that a dangerous, deranged mob attacked the Capitol. You're participating in this worship service on Sunday, but I'm recording this message on Thursday, and much of it was prepared on Wednesday as I watched and listened to the news unfold. I don't know what will happen in the upcoming days, how recent events might prompt rapid change over the next several hours and days. Things could be quite different come Sunday when you listen to this message. But I can only speak from the information that I have right now. And so, humbly, as a pastor, it is my duty, and the duty of the church, which is called to be a community of grace and peace, to address the violent actions that occurred in Washington, D.C. Christianity is not only a religion, it is an entire ethical system, a, a moral framework. For 2,000 years, faithful Christians have prayed and pondered and written and debated and dissented and built a moral architecture to help us follow Christ's way. The pillars of that moral architecture include gratitude, service, compassion, fortitude, justice, wisdom, hope, humility, forgiveness, peace, love, and truth. And so I want to be clear 
about where we stand. As Christians who follow the Prince of Peace, we reject the storming of the U.S. Capitol. As Christians who hear the words of Jesus to Pontius Pilate, for this I came into the world to testify to the truth, we reject conspiracy theories and lies. As Christians, we hear the voice of our Savior proclaiming, no one can serve two masters, and so we reject absolute and unquestioning loyalty to any person of any party or creed. As Christians, followers of the one who was crucified for living a life of resistance to the corrupt actions of the empire, we reject abuses of power. As Christians, the words of the prophet Isaiah ring in our ears, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. We reject inciting people to violence. As Christians, following the one who calmed the storm, who healed the sick and comforted the suffering, we reject leadership that leads to and is based on mistrust and fear. As Christians, we reject actions that are antithetical to Christ and his ways. Sometimes I struggle with balancing my identity as both a pastor and an American citizen. And yet there are many ways in which our obligations as Christians and as Americans overlap. America is a union, and so is the church. The body of Christ is a union of the human and the divine, Jesus' body. We collectively are the body of Christ, and so we too are a union of divinity and humanity. We are not gods, but the Holy Spirit dwells in us, in, in all of our humanness. President Lincoln said our nation was conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. This equality of humankind is not just an American principle, it's biblical, too. Through the Incarnation, God demonstrates that God abides in humanity. God's Spirit dwells in us. There is a spark of the divine at the core of each person. It's what our Quaker siblings call the inner light. In every human soul, there is an element of God's own Spirit. Equality recognizes that light. Equality says that person, although they may be different from me, that person is not worth any more or any less than I am. I may disagree with them from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, but I honor their humanity because they are a child of God. The Holy Spirit resides in them as it resides in me. We are equals. And so equality is sacred. And efforts to undermine and pervert just systems that uphold the equality of people, systems like fair elections, those efforts are unholy. So what is righteous? What is sacred? It's honoring people. It's respecting them. And we do that by being honest, by telling the truth. In his letter to the Ephesians, Paul writes, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. The lies, the distortions, the fabrications, they are a poison, corroding the fabric of our union, 
our common bonds as people of faith, as disciples of Christ, it is our sacred responsibility to uphold the truth and to condemn every action that desecrates the indwelling light of the Spirit by bullying and silencing and discarding people. The truth is that we held a free and fair election in this country. Those who claim that fraud or other wrongful actions occurred have had months to prove those claims in the court of law, which is how civilized societies administer justice. Over 60 lawsuits have been lost or dismissed because there is no evidence of substantial election fraud. This is the truth. But you don't have to take my word for it. That's why we have professionals like judges and legal scholars and journalists with a code of ethics who strive to ensure the free exchange of information that is accurate and fair and thorough who verify information before releasing it, who provide context and take special care not to misrepresent or oversimplify, who identify sources clearly and consider their motives, and who never deliberately distort facts or context. The highest and primary obligation of ethical journalism is to serve the public to be accountable and transparent. We are Christians. We understand the sanctity of upholding ethical principles, which is why we must denounce in the strongest terms possible any person who deliberately lies and misleads people, whipping up anger and resentment and inciting violence. For that is truly the complete opposite of God's work in the world. I wanted to talk about belovedness and belonging in the body of Christ today. I wanted to talk about baptism. Current events intervened. And yet, these things are linked. The Reverend Nadia Boltz Weber writes, and the word that had most recently come from the mouth of God was, this is my beloved in whom I am well pleased. Identity. It's always God's first move. Before we do anything wrong, and before we do anything right, God has named and claimed us as God's own. But almost immediately, other things try to tell us who we are and to whom we belong, but only God can do that. Everything else is temptation. We belong to God. The Reverend Bob Schulman says, you don't have to be baptized to be a beloved child of God. All you have to do is be born. That is enough. We do baptisms to try to make visible what is the already eternal, although invisible, truth. That each one of us is a beloved and cherished child of God. That in each and every human soul, there is an element of God's Spirit. That's why we baptize. To make physical, with water and the Spirit, the metaphysical, intangible truth of our belovedness, our holiness, God's eternal and unconditional love for us. We belong to God. Our baptism is a seal and a sign of this identity, this 
belonging. We are God's people. We are called to be instruments to bring unity and peace to our neighbors. We are equipped through the Spirit with tools for the job. Compassion, justice, wisdom, peacefulness, the pursuit of truth. On this day, when we celebrate the Holy Spirit poured out from heaven upon the body of Christ, let us remember to whom we belong. If we have been baptized, let us remember our baptisms. Or if we were too young to remember, let us recall the promises that were made by our loved ones on our behalf. We renounce the powers of evil and desire the freedom of new life in Christ. We profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We promise, by the grace of God, to be Christ's disciples, to follow in the way of our Savior, to resist oppression and evil, to show love and justice, and to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best as we are able. We promise, according to the grace given to us, to grow in the Christian faith and to be faithful members of the Church of Jesus Christ, celebrating Christ's presence and furthering Christ's mission in all the world. These are the promises made at our baptisms. We seek to uphold them with the help of God. Let us never forget whose we are. Let us never forget to whom we belong. May our lives proclaim it. Amen. In this season, where there is so much happening, so many challenges, so much struggle touching everyone's life in one way or another, we are comforted by a God who hears our prayers and answers them all, albeit in surprising, unanticipated ways. We raise our prayers to God who lifts the burdens that weigh heavy upon our minds and our hearts. We pray not only for ourselves, but for our neighbors, for strangers. So many people have been killed or their health forever harmed by the pandemic that continues to wreak havoc. So many people are hurting and grieving. We pray for them. We pray for all of the healthcare workers, the nurses, the doctors, the therapists, the custodians, the emergency techs, everyone who is on the front line of this war against COVID-19. We pray that God will protect them. And because we pray and then we follow those prayers with action, we promise to do whatever we can to protect them as well, wearing our masks correctly and consistently, maintaining social distance, washing our hands, and only going out if it is absolutely necessary. This is how we can best love our neighbors and protect the people who are sacrificing so much to protect us. We pray for their safety and their physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. And yet, in the midst of this tidal wave of suffering, there are reasons for joy. So we offer prayers of gratitude for God's presence in our lives. We trust that God hears all of our prayers, those we speak aloud, and those we hold in our hearts. 
let us join together for a moment of silent prayer. As our prayer of the people, I'd like to share a prayer written by the Rabbi Daniel Rutenberg this past Wednesday. Let us pray. Our God and God of our ancestors, we ask your blessings for our country, for its government, for its leaders and advisors, and for all who exercise just and rightful authority. Teach them your insights of Torah, that they may administer all affairs of state fairly, that peace and security, happiness and prosperity, justice and freedom may forever abide in our midst. Creator of all flesh, bless the inhabitants of our country with your spirit. May citizens of all races and creeds forge a common bond in true harmony to banish hatred and bigotry and to safeguard the ideals and free institutions that are the pride and glory of our country. May this land help all people to fulfill the vision of your prophet. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they experience war anymore. Now let us join in the prayer our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It can be hard right now, to recognize the ways in which our lives have been blessed by the gifts of God. And yet, if we look closely, if we examine our lives, we realize that we have much. God has blessed us in many ways, and we have the chance to share those blessings in joy and gratitude. Offerings may be mailed to the church or dropped off at the church office, as well as taken in person. May we give for the mission of this congregation and of the church universal in joyful response to the abundant and eternal love of God. Our offering will now be received.
dedicate these gifts together. We give you thanks, O oh God, for every blessing and spiritual gift you have poured out upon us. Let the gifts of our lives be a source of blessing in your world, all to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Let us join together in singing hymn number 561, Shall We Gather at the River? Amen. Mm -hmm. 